What's up, lifting aficionado? So, I asked all of you, what is your most controversial fitness opinion? So, I'm gonna share my opinion on your opinions, and you can give me your opinion in the comments below about my opinions on your opinions. And then I'll react to your comments about my comments about your comments. Just typical YouTube stuff, right? Why did you do this? Okay. So I'm going to share if I agree or disagree, and I'm going to rank your take on the spice meter. So how spicy is your hot take? And there were over 500 comments in the first 12 hours or something, and so I can't get to all of them, but I will react to about 40 or 45 of the spiciest of them. First up, we have a comment from the one and only Basement Bodybuilding. Definitely check out his channel. I will link it in the description. It's a four-parter. The first one, local fatigue is greater than systemic fatigue for hypertrophy. Uh, and he gives an example. I 100% agree. This is a little bit of a spicy take. A lot of people are like, I'm tired. It must be my CNS. Not, not really as much of a thing as people think. So I would say it's a three or a four out of spiciness out of ten. Next one, training in phases or cycles, so periodizing your training, doesn't help hypertrophy, they're overrated. Yeah, I actually would 100% agree, I don't periodize my training, I just progress with a, a standard double progression type of thing, I don't deload, I don't ramp my volume, and then I don't do any of that, uh, and I don't feel like that has negatively impacted my progress, but to some people this is quite a take, so I'm going to give it a 5 out of 10. The third one, isolation lifts are overhated. Not overrated, overhated. I would to a certain extent agree, although pretty much any program for hypertrophy should have a mix of compound and isolation. So I somewhat agree, and I would say in terms of spiciness, spiciness is probably a two or a three. Number four, trying to force progressive overload can be just as bad as not forcing it at all. I somewhat agree. It depends on the person. Some people really do need just a kick in the ass. The reps and the sets look way too easy. They really just need to add weight to the bar more aggressively than they would like. But for some people, yeah, they need to hold back. They need to be more patient. They need to progress a little bit more gradually. So I would say this is quite a quite a spicy take. You know, I would say a five or a six out of ten. Because, you know, progressive overload, that's like the main thing that, that a lot of people talk about. And for somewhat good reason... Um, but I would say overall, I agree. All right, the second one, second comment from Liam. He says, being a fitness jack of all trades is a good thing in many contexts, even though it is looked down upon by the fitness community. Uh, and then he gives some examples and he talks about diminishing returns, etc. And actually, yeah, I, I would agree. You don't necessarily need to specialize in any one lift or any system. And being able to do many things is just going to be more generally useful for most people. So I, overall, I definitely agree. There's nothing wrong with having specific goals, but sometimes the juice is just not worth the squeeze. And I actually don't think this is all that spicy of a take. I, I would say this is probably like a 2.7 out of 10 in terms of the raw spiciness. Next comment from Piggly Wiggly. Never thought I'd say that sentence or word ever. Beginners do not need to do a 3x5 or a 5x5 routine, such as starting strength or strong lifts. They can learn fundamentals of lifting with dumbbells or machines, doing 3-4 to four sets of 8-15 to 15 reps, compounds, and isolation exercises. Um, yeah, I agree. There's no need to do any specific routine. You can start training like an intermediate from the very first time you step in the gym. And there is nothing special about five reps, that's for sure. Yeah, I 100% agree. And uh, I'm going to give this one a one out of 10 for spiciness. This is, you know, this is like mayonnaise level of stuff. I, I said, I said, give me the weird stuff, not don't have to do starting strength. Next comment from Ethan. Two changes that he wants to see in professional bodybuilding. One, stop obsessing over conditioning. Yeah, I would agree. I think especially for natural bodybuilding, I would much prefer to see a standard more like the Silver Age where like 12 to 13 to 14%, maybe 11% was like the standard and it's possible to get too ripped. I think it can make judging a little bit difficult, right? Like in typical bodybuilding, leaner is always better and so it's easy to judge, right? There's, there's less subjectivity. 
And the next one, in non-tested organizations like the IFBB, remove the open category. <sighs> the thing is, what do you do now? You have a weight cap for everyone? Like, what if someone is just bigger, right? Like, obviously, that is going to limit the amount of drugs, but they have classic if they want to do that. So I would say, like, I understand why, but I would say this is not really needed. Well, I agree with the first one about the body fat percentage, but I don't agree with the second one. I think people should have the option to do whatever they want. Like, obviously, I'm not pro-steroids by any means, but I am certainly pro-do whatever the fuck you want. All right, next one from Alexander Stoyanov. Some exercises are pretty good if you do their cheated version, cheat curls or cheat dips. Ooh, I agree with the curls. Cheat dips, I don't know about that. I, that's not something I would really sign off on. If a client's like, can I do these cheated? No. I think dips are already an exercise that gives some people shoulder issues or a little bit harder on the body. And so and maybe a little bit of like a, an oomph out of the bottom position. You see uh, like Lu Xiaojun when he's doing dips, he's really like driving with his head. I think that's okay. But excessively, probably not a great idea. It's already a very stimulatory movement, already very, very stressful in the bottom position. So I don't think doing it too aggressively is a great idea. So overall, in spiciness, I would say for curls, maybe like a 2 or a 3 out of 10. But for dips, 8 or a 9 out of 10. All right, next one from Jake Earl. 99.99% of lifters never come anywhere close to overtraining, yet overtraining is still fear-mongered across the fitness industry. Yeah, I see those all the time. I wrote a, a section in my book and you're not overtrained, okay? Like, lifting is not going to cause overtraining unless you combine it with cardio or something has gone dramatically and drastically wrong in your life, like you're super stressed or you're just not eating or not sleeping or something like that. Um, but generally, overtraining syndrome is just not going to happen from lifting. You'll break down structurally, you'll get injured first. So in terms of spiciness, I would say this is like a 3 or 4 out of 10, and I agree. All right, next one. Most people who just work out for health or recreational don't need perfection, neither diet nor training. They need enjoyment just to stay in the game long term. Yeah, I would say consistency is going to be key for the vast majority of people. Most people are not like super, super motivated and driven and are willing to go through the amount of suffering to really like completely max out their physique. And so, yeah, if you're lifting for health, which most people probably should be, yeah, you don't need perfection, and chasing perfection, if that gets in the way of consistency, is not a good idea, which, ironically, is not perfection. So I'm going to give that one a 4 out of 10, and I pretty much agree for the most part. All right, next one from Ben Mitchell. Higher reps, 15 to 20, are highly effective on most exercises. Of course, something like a squat or a deadlift would be the exception, but for most pulls, pushes, isolation exercises, I've always gotten a better mind-muscle connection and stimulus from going higher in reps and he says that the reason it gets a bad rap is because people don't like to actually push it close enough to failure there are form breakdowns not enough emphasis emphasis on the eccentric or the stretch etc yeah i would agree you know 15 to 20 is a fine rep range and if you can't get results from that yeah often it's no, you're not actually going close to failure and so the reason why most people don't go as close to failure is because it hurts, right? It's uncomfortable. You get that that lactic acid, that burning. Sometimes repeatability is an issue. Sometimes consistency and adherence are the issue. Um, I would say this can be effective if you're willing to push yourself. In terms of raw spiciness, I'm going to give that one a two. All right, Kevin Hester wrote, Upright rows do not cause shoulder impingement if you have normal healthy posture. So I would say there's there's partly a genetic factor here. The shoulder joint just does have some inherent genetic variability. But overall, yeah, I would say the fear-mongering for upright rows, it's sort of swinging both ways where now it's like more acceptable, which I think is good. Um, so I would say in terms of spiciness, this is now like maybe a 3 or 4 out of 10. But a few years ago, it would have been like a 7 or an 8 out of 10 in some circles. All right, next one from On the Ball City 71 Rock climbing is the ultimate combination of strength, technique, flexibility, power, and endurance. All training should have climbing as the ultimate goal. Ooh, that is spicy, especially that last part. All training should. Mm, yeah, I disagree with that. Um, I don't think you have to climb at all. You can if you want to, but it's by no means necessary at all. Um, it's a fine way to train. If you like it, do it. 
but uh, no need at all. And in terms of spiciness, I'm going to give this one an 8. That That's a big statement, dude. All right, this one's good. Bodybuilding is not a sport. It's a performance art slash pageant. I think the word pageant really pisses some, some bodybuilders off. Or, like, you know, the IFBB will announce, like, the athletes are coming in. Oh, I'm always just like, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think most, not most, but some people will agree, yeah, it, it's not really a sport. It's more of a, a, a beauty pageant. Well, beauty is... Uh, but in terms of spiciness, I would say this is probably... I mean, in some circles, this is like a 10 out of 10. You know, because beauty pageant, it's like Miss America. And so they don't want to be associated with that. But it is. All right, next question from Jeffrey Anderson. Gaining muscle is a great goal, but keeping track of the actual I put on two to four pounds of muscle in X time period is a guess at best. Yeah, especially if you are in a slightly fluffier state, you don't actually know how much. Like when I say, oh, I probably gained about this much muscle in a year, that's just an estimation. It could be off by 20 or 30 percent. But I think if you're lean and you're measuring, you know, your arms, you're measuring your forearms, you're measuring your chest, you're measuring your quads, like all these other areas, you can tell if you're gaining muscle. Plus, you know, strength for reps across a variety of lifts with the same technique after you've been training them, that's going to be very correlated with muscle growth as well. And so you can tell if you're making progress, but you don't know exactly how many grams of tissue you added. Not that spicy. I'm going to give it a three. Next one, the overhead press is functionally better and more impressive strength-wise than the bench press. Wow. Now, uh, amongst powerlifters, this is very, very spicy. A lot of them have, like, depressingly small overhead numbers compared to their bench strength, especially if, you know, they're hyper-optimizing. Not that that's a thing anymore. <laughs> um, but in terms of spiciness, I, I would agree, actually, and I would say this is probably like a, a 6 or a 7, especially in powerlifting circles. All right, next one. Being drug-tested actually means something. Um... I somewhat agree. You, you get these comments like, tested doesn't mean natural. And I guess I agree, right? Like, there are probably some people who are, like, cycling off and cycling on. Like, I know there's experts who, like, tell people how to avoid the drug test or beat the tests. And, you know, by all accounts, or a lot of accounts, it's not that hard to beat the test. But I think it actually does mean something. Yeah, if you look at the tested records in general, they are lower than the untested records. Some of them are getting kind of close. Um, but yeah, I think this does mean something. And I would say most drug-tested athletes are drug-free. That's a little bit spicy in and of itself, especially on uh, some pages. So I would say this is like a 6 or a 7 out of 10 in spiciness. And uh, I agree. Next one, the good girl, bad girl machine. So good girl, bad girl. No, the other way. No, no, that's right. Yeah. Is the most underrated component in leg training for hypertrophy. I wouldn't say it's the most important, but underrated. Yeah, I could get behind that. Um, you know, it's, you work the glutes, the medius, the meat of the medius, which is not lift, which is not worked with a lot of other movements. Uh, and then you work the adductors, which are like one of the most underdeveloped muscle groups in a lot of people. And if you have small adductors, it almost doesn't matter how big your quads are, right? Because you'll still have a fucking thigh gap. Like, if you're a dude with a thigh gap, that's hot. So I 100% agree, and I would say in terms of spiciness, this is like a 7 or an 8 out of 10. For a lot of people, especially, like, power lifters, they don't like this machine. You know, it's just like squats or go home, and, you know, if it doesn't have a barbell, it ain't for me. All right, the next one, upright rows and behind the neck presses are an OP superset for delt hypertrophy. Yeah, I would actually agree. I would say for a lot of people, they do not like these movements. They think they're injurious. Maybe they don't have a lot of shoulder mobility. It is going to be somewhat individual. I would say this is probably like a six or a seven in terms of spiciness. Um, and I somewhat agree because there are some people who definitely probably shouldn't be doing, definitely probably, they shouldn't be doing these movements, but for a lot of people, they are money, so best to go by feel. All right, next one, weighted calisthenics and rings are superior for both hypertrophy and upper body strength compared to traditional weight training. 
Ooh, that's a big one. That is, I would say it's an eight or a nine out of spiciness. I somewhat agree. I think they're a very, very good addition. Are they overall superior for both hypertrophy and upper body strength? Probably not. I think if that was the case, you would see a lot of IFBB pros and top natural bodybuilders and just like the biggest people and most developed people, the elite, using them. But you don't see that that much. Now, I wrote a whole book on rings. I love rings. I incorporate them pretty regularly. Um, And I think they're very, very good for chest. I think they are decent for lats, okay for traps, decent for shoulders, okay for biceps. But are they going to be overall superior? Mm, Probably not. All right, that is all for this video. If you want to show some support, definitely grab a copy of my new book. I won't go into the marketing and why you should buy it, but uh, you should. All right, that's all for this video, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.